Good morning. Welcome to this live broadcast from the Unitarian Universalist community in Springfield, Vermont. As you well know, this is a time of great joy and celebration for many religious traditions around the world. We appreciate each and every one of you, whatever your personal religious or community traditions might be. Let us then celebrate that what we have in common. I hope you enjoy the service and I thank you for spending this time with us. <clears throat> To this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let our stories warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let our collective vision change your heart. Welcome to this time of worship together. And this is Easter Sunday and it is the seventh in our eighth eight-part series celebrating the life and teachings the legacy of Howard Thurman medicine for our times because indeed the, the legacy the life and teachings of Howard Thurman is just what we need right now and that's what we are about today here at the end of winter and as we move into spring behind us many challenges ahead of us glad surprises inshallah so here are these words for our chalice lighting which are from howard thurman this is what easter means It is the announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death, that life is bottomed by the glad surprise. The words of Howard Thurman. And we are beyond blessed to have this amazing worship team with us. And in addition to our regular Springfield folks, we have four guest ministers. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's, a, it's part of our wonderful Howard Thurman series. So um, yeah, Deb is going to spotlight our team and g give an opportunity to say hello and identify yourself. Crystal, you want to go first? Sure. Crystal Owens, so glad to be here and to join all of my peers and as well as uh you here and the community thank you and and crystal's joining us um from cheverly mass from the empowerance empowerment center down there which uh, she is the, the the founder and director of so and and how about you robin and good Debbie morning yes good morning and happy easter my name is robin ruffner and i'm a licensed practitioner of religious science and i'm here from still point spiritual center in atlanta georgia and I just want to say that here, as Reverend Mellon mentioned, that we're in our seventh of the eight part series. And I'm almost feeling a little melancholy right now because it's kind of winding down in this particular form. I know we continue to carry the message. But anyway, I'm so glad to be here with all of you this morning. OK, and Deb is going to highlight Will and Usher as well. 
I'm so Will Hunter, and I'm the minister at the Weathersfield Center Church, and it's a joy to be participating in a joint service again and to have it coincide with the wonderful Howard Thurman series. And uh, it's just such a wonderful way to celebrate Easter as life comes back into the world around us. Fabulous. So glad you're here, Will, and a special welcome also um, to all the Weathersfield folks. And Usher, if you unmute, unmute yourself and speak, that'll make it easier for Deb to find yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted. There we go. Excellent. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, my name is Minister Usher Moses, and I'm deeply and profoundly glad to be a part of this, this faith congregation. And um, I'm just so thankful for being a part of the Sunday Circle headed by Crystal, and I'm the senior minister there. And so just, I just, I'm so thankful and grateful for this opportunity. Wonderful. And um, yeah, Usher's also with the Empowerment Center and, and Cheverly Mass, and it has been truly, truly a blessing, a total blessing to, to work with this amazing team to bring medicine for our time, the, the life and teachings of, of Howard Thurman. And what better way to go into Easter than with this amazing song, Lo, the earth awakes again. And um, you may know different versions of it. Alleluia is the message. Here we are. It is spring. So, the, so you can mute and sing along. I love that song. Thank you so much to Julaine and Virtual Choir for putting that together. And what a beautiful image up here in Vermont. Indeed, the Pussy Willows are exactly what's in bloom right now. So here's a story from Howard Thurman. In uh, 1936, 37, 35, somewhere right in there, five, um, Howard Thurman and his wife, Susan Bailey Thurman, went to India and um, they, they went as a, mish, a pilgrimage of friendship. And one of the highlights of their experience is that they met Mahatma Gandhi. And it was a profound meeting that influenced the course of history because they had deep, deep discussions with Gandhi about nonviolent resistance. And Thurman received, gave much to Gandhi. It was an incredible exchange. Gandhi wanted to know all about what was going on and the resistance in, in America. And Thurman took back with him the gift he received from Thurman of that deep discussion and engagement about nonviolent resistance. And at the end, 
Gandhi had a request. He wanted them to sing a song for, for him. And he, he had a specific request. He wanted the song, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? It's, it's a song for Easter. It's a song about the suffering and rebirth. And what, um, what Gandhi said is that this song captures and epitomizes the human experience. And so Thurman and Susan, Susan Bailey Thurman and the others who were with, with him sang this song for Gandhi and for Gandhi's entourage. So um, Julaine, I'm so grateful that you produced it for us. So let's, let's, let's hear the song and see some images of Thurman and Susan and their trip to India.
looks so beautiful. Thank you so much, Julaine, for doing that for us, sharing that with us. And what Gandhi said is, the question in the song is, were you there? Were you there in the suffering of other people, in your own suffering, in Jesus' suffering? Of course you were. You were there. This, this is the human experience. But it doesn't end with the suffering. Were you there when he rose up from the tomb? Gandhi's message is that there was always hope. There was always hope. And I love, I love this story because it really is, it captures race enmity. Next, next month, and uh, we're going to do a star, our final service in this eight-month series on Howard Thurman. We're going to do it on race enmity. The friendship among people of different colors, which is always there, always foundational. And that trip to India, the pilgrimage of friendship, where Howard and, Howard and Susan Thurman traveled around and met many, many different people, including Gandhi. And they felt their common humanity, both in the suffering and in the glad surprise of resurrection that always comes, spring, spring renewal. It's about love. It's about this magnificent flow of love that is present both in the suffering and in the joy. So join me, if you would, in the words of our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve the needs of all beings to the end that all so shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. And Will has a reading for us. The Gospel according to Luke. But on this first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. But on entering, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass while they were wondering what to make of this, that behold, two men stood by them in dazzling raiment. And when the women were struck with fear and bowed their faces to the ground, they said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was yet in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and having returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who were with them, who were telling these things to the apostles. But the tale seemed to them to be nonsense, and they did not believe the women. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stepping down, he saw the linen cloths laid there, and he went away wondering to himself at what had come to pass. The Resurrection, The Glad Surprise by Howard Thurman. There is an ever something compelling and exhilarating about the glad surprise. The emphasis is upon glad. There are surprises that are shocking, startling, frightening, and bewildering. But the glad surprise is something different from all of these. It carries with it the element of elation, of life, of something over and beyond the surprise itself. 
the experience itself comes at many levels. The simple joy that comes when one discovers that the balance in the bank is larger than the personal record indicated, and there is no error in the accounting. The realization that one does not have his door key, the hour is late and everyone is asleep, but someone very thoughtfully left the latch off just in case. The dreaded meeting in a conference to work out some problems of misunderstanding and things are adjusted without the emotional lacerations anticipated. The report from the doctor's exam that all is well when one was sure that the physical picture was very serious indeed. All of these surprises are glad. There is a deeper meaning in the concept of the glad surprise. This meaning has to do with the very ground and foundation of hope about the nature of life itself, the manifestation, this quality in the world about us can be best witnessed in the coming of spring. This is ever a new thing, a glad surprise, the stirring of life at the end of winter. One day, there seems to be no sign of life, and then almost overnight, swelling buds, delicate blooms, blades of grass, bugs, insects, an entire world of newness everywhere. This is the glad surprise at the end of winter. Often the same experience come at the end of a long tunnel of tragedy and tribulation. It is as if a man stumbling in the darkness, having lost his way, finds the spot at which he falls is the foot of a stairway that leads from darkness into light. Such is the glad surprise. This is what Easter means at, in the experience of the race. This is the resurrection. This is the announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death, that there is no road that is at last swallowed up in an ultimate darkness that there is strength added when the labors increase, that multiplied peace matches multiplied trials, that life is bottomed by the glad surprise. Take courage, therefore. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our father's full giving is only begun. The choir has prepared an anthem for us. Um, it's entitled Sweet Radiant Mystery. And as Crystal was reading, I was thinking that the sweet radiant mystery is the glad surprise. Um, and the song asks to help us hear the endless song of all that is and was and ever shall be. So let's listen to the choir and see these beautiful images of coming spring. Oh my God, that was just beautiful. Oh my God, it's so wonderful to see nature up close and personal, to become intimate with it. It just really shines forth the mystery of life indeed. And it really shows me that life truly is bottomed by the glad surprise because each one of those pictures had a surprise in and of itself as I got to see nature at that level. And so I want to say that, you know, life is undergirded, you know, bottomed, it's supported, it's, it's really lifted up and buoyed up by a magnificent power and presence all of the time and but oftentimes we forget you know how 
wonderful and magnificent life is and that all we have to do is just rest in the everlasting arms of pure spirit and just bear witness to how God comes forth because each and every picture showed me really the intricacies of life itself. And even as I look at Lee's picture, that background of all those carrots is like the glad surprise. When I look out at the azaleas in my house right now, there is all fuchsia. There's a spray of fuchsia on my upslope. That's the glad surprise every year. And every year I'm surprised as if I've never seen it before. And so it just continually reminds me, continues to remind me that life truly is bottomed by something magnificent. Something magnificent is always going on. But we forget. And you know, Howard Thurman, all of his prose seemed to come forth when I was thinking about bringing forth this particular talk, because he reminds us in one of his prose called Fresh, um, he fresh before me, my high resolve, it's called I resolve. But he talks about how easy it is to forget. You know, when we see all of these beautiful images and, and the flowers blooming and the birds singing and the insects coming alive, in that moment, we are so aware of the isness of God just springing forth in a magnificent way. And oftentimes when we have our own personal epiphanies and meditation and prayer time, we think that those times at those moments will illumine our path for all the rest of our journey. You know, we never intend to betray it. We never intend to forget about it. But he speaks very clearly and breaks it down in a magnificent way of how easy it is to forget. There's just nothing momentous, nothing overwhelming, nothing flagrant happens, just the wear and tear of life itself. The dust and the grit of the journey comes in and we forget. And I forget when winter comes that spring will spring forth again, that we will see the magnificent colors and beauty all around us. But I want to say that if you find yourself in a place of forgetfulness, that I find that there's about four, three to four processes that help me to reconnect with the spirit. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. And the first one is to provide a space. You know, we have to provide a place for spirit to show up in our life. And in order to provide a space, I have to let go of that which is blocking and damming up and, and obstructing this magnificent power and presence to move through me and to move through my life. So I have to let go of all of that, which no longer serves. And we hear that all the time. And I know that that's not an easy feat, but there does come a time where we just really have to just surrender all of that and then move into a place of becoming familiar with the spirit. How do we become familiar with the presence of God? We have to just take time to be with pure spirit. We have to, and then the space that has been provided, we have to really allow ourselves to become intimate. I like to call it courting the divine. Any of you that have taken my classes, and there's a couple of people here that have, I always talk about how it is imperative to have this intimate relationship with spirit. And Thurman speaks to this as well, actually in his prose called The Triumphant Entry, which is another beautiful prose. And if you have one of his books the, for the Inward Journey or Meditations of the Heart, I know it's in those two books. It's a wonderful Easter prose as well. And he talks to how Jesus literally had this relationship with spirit that he was, he kept many late night trysts with the spirit where he was just truing his spirit. So let's just pause there for a moment. What is a tryst? A tryst is a rendezvous. It's becoming intimate. It is having this appointment, appointment with a lover. So it's just like allowing ourselves to become totally at one with God. For me, what that looks like is when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep, I have an option. I can turn on the TV or go to social media or I can just lay there and be in prayer and meditation and commune with this presence that is closer to me than breathing itself and become attuned to its voice so I can recognize it when there's a lot of chaos going on in my life because I become intimate. I spend some intimate times with it, listening to it and allowing it to true my spirit. 
it goes on to say in that very same uh, part of the prose that Jesus became so close. He was having this relationship that he was allowing spirit to, to, to really work with him in a magnificent way, true in his spirit. And he had worked so close with God that the line of demarcation between his life and God's life would fade and reappear and fade and reappear. Mm, what does that mean? It means that we sometimes don't have a strong connection, just like our computers. If we have a strong connection, we can see everybody on the screen and we can talk and hear each other. If the connection is not quite as strong, there are times where our screens may freeze up or we may miss a word or two. So we have to connect with the spirit so we can have a very strong connection and know that there's something moving through us. We just need to get, as Ralph Waldo Emerson says, get our bloated nothingness out of the divine circuit that spirit can truly use us and have full sway as our very life. That's when we connect with spirit at a very deep level. But it takes time to do this. It doesn't come overnight. It doesn't, doesn't come because I want it to come. This is, it's a process, you know, and so we have to really make the time, avail ourselves to it. And it doesn't mean that we have to spend hours and hours in meditation. I venture to say, if we are consistent on a regular basis, the time will work itself out. I often tell people, especially that are new to meditating, to just take two minutes a day, two minutes. Can you give up two minutes for this living spirit? And before you know it, when you sit on a consistent basis every day, before you know it, I have found that the two minutes end up being five minutes, the five minutes end up being seven minutes, the seven minutes end up being 10 minutes, 10 to 15. And before I know it, I'm sitting there 45 minutes and I'm just caught up in the spirit. But I have availed myself to make time for the spirit every day. I can't help but to think about when I was a child and probably between the age of seven and 10, my grandmother lived with us and my brother's two and a half years younger than myself. So if I was seven, he was five and we would come home from school. And of course, we just had a lot of energy running around, making all this noise. But every day around 415, my grandmother say, OK, you all have to be very quiet now because I'm going to study. And our house wasn't very big, but we had a telephone table. And I know that I'm dating myself now, but it's a little ch uh, chair that's kind of connected to a little tiny table, almost looks like a desk, but people would put their telephones on it because at that time, we did not wear our telephones on our wrist or have one in our purse like we do today with this cell phones. And so my grandmother would sit at the telephone table, pull out this little book, read some passage, it was only one page, and she would just go into the silence. And I was a very inquisitive child and I always questioned everything. So sometimes I would get real close to her and I would look at her, I'm like, she, her eyes are closed. I'm like, how is she studying with her eyes closed? My grandmother was meditating and she did that every single day. And what I know is that after a couple of days, my brother and I would automatically know it's time for her to study. So we have to become quiet. So in a way, we got into this vibration, this frequency, if you will, without even knowing it, of tapping into this stillness. And I'm sure, just because I know that when I meditate, that has that created an atmosphere in our house of this peace and this stillness just for those 15 minutes or so, 15 or 20 minutes that she would do this every day. I did the same thing with my godchildren. He, my, one of my godchildren has three sisters and they would come to my house and I have a lot of what I call spiritual paraphernalia, energy, chimes, singing, bowls, rain sticks, things like that. They would come and they would play with all these things and get their energy real worked up. And I say, okay, now it's time to do ohms. And they would laugh and giggle every own we did. And then finally, I said, okay, we're not coming out until we really do our owns. 
And then finally, one day they came to the house and they had all this energy built up. And they said, it's time for us to do ohms now, isn't it? So they even knew that once the energy got so high, that it's time now to bring it inward. And they started to really even understand what that meant. So I say that we have to really take time and avail ourselves to the spirit. And Thurman speaks to this in one of his prose called The Daily Temptus. And it's talking about cultivating, providing a larger margin of ourself that is available for the cultivation of the inner life. And he goes on to say that it takes time to cultivate the mind. It takes time to grow in wisdom. It takes time to savor the qualities of living. It takes time to feel one's way into oneself. It takes time to walk with God. And so we have to become familiar, but we have to make the time. And then we have to surrender. And this is a little bit different than just giving up the stuff that no longer serves. Surrendering. It's much like an exercise that I've experienced in many retreats where they'll ask that one person falls back into another person's arms and just trust that they're going to be caught by that person. So surrendering is falling back into the arms of pure spirit and trusting that life is bottomed by this glad surprise that life is supported, it's undergirded by something magnificent, an all powerful presence. And when you make the surrender, it's also combined with committing to it, committing to pure spirit, committing to this journey, committing to just trust that right where we are, right where you are, the power and the presence of God is. There's no place to go to get it. It's right in the midst of thee. And God is almighty in the midst of you. And when we, when we commit and have this intimate relationship with pure spirit, it is from this place that we realize that we're imbued with an authority to change that which is not in alignment with pure spirit. And really to more than us changing something, just knowing that something is changed because we open up and allow the goodness of God that already is, it's already an established fact. We're not creating anything or making anything happen. We're allowing something to move through us. And here again, Thurman talks about this commitment and another one of his prose called A Seed Upon the Wind. And he talks about how when we commit, when we surrender, when we have that utter yielding at our core, when we relax our will to allow the will of God, and he, he goes on to say that it doesn't come without exacting struggle of the soul. But when we make that commitment and allow one by one the outpost of our spirit to come under, ooh, this new authority of pure spirit. He says that one by one, the outpost of his spirit is captured and we take it again through hours, months, even years of warfare. Because see, it's, it's oftentimes more comfortable for us to stay in the, we, we acclimate easily to that which is uncomfortable versus stepping out into something new because we don't always trust the process. But he talks about once you make that commitment and have that utter yielding, he said there often follows the long silence when nothing stirs. Well, I wonder if that long silence was the three days that Jesus laid in the tomb. They thought he was dead. 
And during that time, perhaps, he was allowing the power and the presence and the love and the will of pure spirit to just infiltrate his entire being. Because sometimes we have to go in the closet, go into the holy of holies, go into that very secret, sacred place, alone and unencumbered without anybody else around us. And just allow God to allow that spirit of God, the anointing of pure spirit to fall fresh upon us. And we have to take it in and absorb it by ourselves. Oh, community is wonderful. Churches and classes and workshops, oh, they have their purpose and their place on our journey. But I tell you, you have to come to the garden alone to really get it and embody it and take it in and allow it to move through you, that you can be that strong, strong conscious conjoint. And I use the word strong because the power of God is so omnipotent that we have to be strong enough to carry that vibration, to carry that frequency. And when we get it, when we get absorbed and enmeshed in it, and it is in us and we are in it, when you become one with the one and know that you are, Oh, there's a different kind of a renewal and a resurgence. Oh, yes, you can't help but to be born again. And everything and anything unlike the nature of God has to fall away into the nature of no thingness and nothingness for whence it came. Because it can't not be sustained in this high vibration, in this high frequency. So perhaps the tomb is a very high state of consciousness. I believe it's Charles Fillmore that speaks to that. Let's look at things just a little bit differently. And then we rise up with a new power. And oh, I love the scripture this morning. Because when Peter went to that tomb, to the closet, to that holy of holies, he didn't see Jesus, but he saw those clothes. So it was evidence to him that he had been there. But I just wonder if Jesus had ascended to such a high state of consciousness that those that were not quite there yet couldn't see him yet. Hmm. I know that oftentimes when my life starts to shift and change, that some people, friends, family, that I've been extremely close with just fall away. Nothing has happened. Nothing has no argument, nothing overwhelming, nothing momentous, nothing flagrant. It's just that we're different. We're, we're, we're vibrating at different frequencies, at different levels. They don't have a desire to be with me, and I don't necessarily have a desire anymore to be with them. Nothing wrong. Everybody's in their rightful place. I often think about this as also when I think about walking the labyrinth. If you've walked the labyrinth with many people, there are times that you are right next to them on the one path over. And then there's other times where you might be in the center and they may be on 10 rungs out. And then all of a sudden, when you walk out of the center, you're right together again. It's just the way the journey unfolds. And we can just trust the process. So what I would like to... I guess leave with you today. There's so much more I can say. I mean, I have to say that this was such a wonderful experience for me to just be with writing and bringing forth this particular talk. There was, I could talk for, I really, I promise you I could probably talk for about four or five hours on this subject right about now. But I thought, hmm, maybe you'll do a class in the Lytton season next year, leading up to the time of Easter, so you can share all of your ideas. So anyway, so this has been a wonderful creative process for myself, but what I would like to leave with you is that every moment you can pivot, you can redirect and connect to the living spirit within you and know that your life is bottomed by the glad surprise. And you will be amazed to see how God comes forth and expresses itself in and through and as your life. Namaste.
Let us give thanks for Sister Robin sharing this wonderful, outstanding message. Let us just humble ourselves right now and just take in the energy and the vibration of her words and the words that were downloaded into her spirit. Right now, divine source, divine God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity on this day of Resurrection Sunday. A day that people around the globe are celebrating the resurrection of the man we call Jesus the Christ, Yeshua, Hamashiach. We'll give thanks to all those that are here listening to this awesome, inspirational interfaith community. We're so thankful, dear God, to just right now humble ourselves and just receive the message that we just heard. This message of reconnecting with the spirit through space, a intimate relationship with God, surrendering and committing to thy will. Dear God, we need to reconnect as we're experiencing this resurrection, this springtime, let us reconnect with you. Let us take what Sister Robin said, this, this process, this spiritual engineering and retool, renew, so we, we can be connected like a bridge and have that spiritual highway between us and thyself and the divine. That spiritual highway we need is only built through spiritual engineering. And Robert just laid out the plans. So we're so thankful for your divine presence, and your divine love, most of all. And as we continue on this journey called life, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us. Let us experience this nonviolence, joy, and love. And a very powerful and wonderful song down by the riverside, there's a stanza in it that says, study war no more. Study war no more. There cannot be war if we study love. S study the medicine for our time and that's love nonviolence through the teachings of a great honorable and mystical man we call Howard Thurman. Dear God, we are here just to, not just here, but to take this information and transform ourselves in a higher and deeper, but most of all loving way. There's a wonderful song that says all about love it's all about love. No matter what your theology, religion, whatever it may be, your unified field theory, whatever it may be, it's all about love. And we are learning that. We continue to absorb it, grow from it, be mystical beings connecting with the universe, developing the space, the intimacy with God, the surrendering and the commitment. Dear God, we thank you for every person that is in the sound of my voice and in the connection with the all divine source. We are so wonderfully made by your presence, God, but we want to continue to grow as we grow older, wiser, but let that wisdom be centered in love. We're so thankful and grateful. Now let this day that we've learned about reconnecting with the spirit, continue to manifest and teach us 
there might be some other teaching that the divine will give you based on this wonderful message. And we will continue to grow and we will see the light, that beautiful light around us continue to grow. And somebody say, thank God for your wisdom and understanding. But most of all, thank you for your love. The name and love of the almighty God, almighty divine source. Let us all say amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Oh. Thank you so much. My heart is just full of gratitude and joy. <laughs> this is beautiful, beautiful spiritual meal. Wow. That we have been given. Thank you so much, Usher, for your prayer. Helping us settle into your beautiful message, Robin. Going deep into how, how Howard Thurman lived. And thank you, Crystal, for that beautiful reading the glad surprise and thank you will for that foundation of the scripture from Luke and thank you thank you to Julaine and the virtual choir for the music and Gail that has threaded through this experience wow how can we be so lucky to be fed Woo! to be really fed by all of these images and words and music and sound and glances and love. Wow, we are very, very fortunate. Thank you to each one of you. So I'm going to extinguish our chalice with those words again. From Howard Thurman. This, this is what Easter means in the experience of the human race. It is the announcement that life cannot be defeated by death. That life is bottomed by the glad surprise. Take courage, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, take courage. With that, I formally close the service.